Welcome to the Psych Central Show, where each episode presents an in-depth look at issues from the fields of psychology and mental health. With your host, Gabe Howard, and featuring Vincent M. Wales. Welcome, everyone, to this week's edition of the Psych Central Show. With me, as always, is Vincent M. Wales. How you doing, Vin? I'm doing good. Thanks. Excellent. This week, we're going to talk about some persistent myths around suicide, and particularly the myth that during the holiday season, particularly during the Christmas holidays, it's one of the biggest holidays that we have in America, that the suicide rate spikes. Vin, have you heard eh, this? Try again. <laughs> Not true. It is not only not true, but a lot of people believe that it's very dangerous. Uh, for example, per Enenberg Public Policy Center, uh, back in the 2009-2010 holiday season, they found that 50% of all articles perpetuated this myth, the myth that suicidal rates spike during the holiday season, and only 23% of mainstream press debunked the myth in any way. And uh, Dan Romer, who is the director of the APPC's Adolescent Communications Institute, specifically said, It is unfortunate that the holiday suicide myth persists in the press. Aside from misinforming the public, this sort of reporting misses an opportunity to shed light on the more likely causes of suicide. And... This is the most interesting thing from researching this for this podcast. December has the lowest suicide rate of any month. The suicide rate actually peaks in the spring and the fall. So December is is different for a lot of reasons. Yeah, and it's not hard to see why. I mean, you know, you've got the holidays. People are going to be spending time with their families. They've got that that support built in around them. So it, it only makes sense that suicidal ideation wouldn't be high in December. This is the interesting thing for me. So my background is I, I came from a loud family. And by a loud family, I mean we, we yelled at each other a lot. And we had a lot of family drama. I'm not trying to throw my family under the bus here, but you know, you know we always had those relatives that we didn't talk to the rest of the year. But Christmas, my family celebrates Christmas, Christmas always lessened that, you, you know, hearts softened. All of a sudden, you, you know, we'll, we'll go with, you know, Uncle John, not a real person. Uncle John was allowed to come over uh, for Christmas dinner. We, we talked to family that was more estranged during the holidays because it made us want to reach out. Plus, the holidays are pretty. I, I think there's a, <laughs> there's a well-known Christmas spirit going on amongst everybody, you know, goodwill towards men and and... Everything else All that, that the, jazz. Yeah. <laughs> everything else that the holidays say. So uh, interestingly enough, if we did this all year round, we could do a lot to lower the suicide rates tremendously. Among other things. Among other things. Yes. <laughs> yes. We're we're going to keep it to uh, we're going to keep it to suicide and try not to solve all the sure. other problems America has for. Yeah. Yeah, for, for today only. Maybe we'll start another podcast. I'm sure we will. <laughs> because, and you know, truthfully, and that's a good, a good thing to bring up right now, is that there are so many myths uh, surrounding suicide that it, it's not even funny. Um, and I'm sure we're going to touch on a couple of them today. Um, for example, you want to want to throw one out there? Another suicide myth that persists is if you ask somebody if they're thinking about killing themselves, if you're asking if somebody's planning on committing suicide, you will give them the idea and therefore ensure that they do it. Yeah, right. <laughs> it, you're never going to give them the idea. It's already crossed their minds if, it, if they're feeling that way. And if they're not feeling that way, your words aren't going to mean a thing. So I, I, have a, I have a friend who is a registered nurse. And she works um, with she works with patients at the end of their life. And her and I had a very interesting conversation once. And she said that the worst thing that you can do to somebody at the end of their life is mince words. You know, if you know that somebody is going to die, you have to say to them, you are going to die. You, you have to own those words. If you say that you might die, you could possibly die. Uh, this, this doesn't allow them to capture what is happening. They, they cling to hope. They cling to faith. They cling to ideas. I thought this was particularly in parallel with suicide because so often we want to ask people that are depressed, oh, are you okay? 
And, of course, people that are depressed tend to give the, oh, I'm fine. And then we're like, oh, well, I asked them if they were thinking about hurting themselves. And, of course, no, you didn't. It's important if somebody is thinking about harming themselves and you want to get in the middle of that, you very specifically say, are you thinking of harming yourself? Are you thinking of killing yourself? Are you thinking of committing suicide? We have to own those words in order to help people. Sure. And, you know, the question is, well, when do you ask that? And many people don't realize that there are a number of of signs uh, of of suicidal ideation in people. There are all sorts of things from the way they talk, uh, the way they feel, and the way they act. Uh, if a, if a person is talking, for example, about being a burden to others or having no reason to live, that's that's a pretty pretty good one right there. Or if they're behavior changes in a way that seems unlike them, if they've increased their use of drugs or alcohol, if they've withdrawn from people or activities that you know they like. Um, another big one is if they start giving away their possessions. Uh, that's, uh, that's one that should alarm you a little bit. Now, for those, for those folks that turn off the credits at the end of the show or haven't read your <laughs> bio, uh, Vin, you, you were a, a suicide hotline operator. Yes, I was a suicide prevention crisis counselor. That's a mouthful, but that's what I was, yes. And you have specific training on this. So it, it's it's safe to say that, that what you're saying is is researched and, and the studies uphold that, that these methods work. We're not just randomly spewing what Gabe and Vin think will work. We're, we're stating fact. Sure, exactly. And, you know, part of the training that I went through was to learn about suicide, learning what these myths are. And, and, and the truths behind them, you know, what their real stats are and, and that sort of thing. And I tell you, it was pretty eye-opening for me because I had subscribed to some of these myths, including the Christmas peak of, of successful suicides. This is one of the areas where, of course, the, the mainstream media really needs to, you know, to step up because we do rely on what we hear on the news and, and what is spread by our friends and family as, as reality. And, you know, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention just, you know, these stats just simply don't hold up. One could say that the fact checkers are asleep at the wheel when it comes to this particular topic. Do you have any thoughts as to why that might be? Well, I think it's pretty clear that in general, the media is pretty poor at verifying anything these days. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that's what you're asking. Suicide is one of those unspeakable things. We don't, uh, we don't talk about it. It's one of those secret shames. I mean, people in our society are scared to death of being murdered or terrorism when the truth of the matter is suicide is far more likely than any of those things. Well, let's throw out Get, some numbers. D- Let, let's, let's own this with some facts. So, let's do. so Deaths by homicide. Let's go for 2013. U.S. Center for Disease Control said that in 2013, 16,121 people were murdered. Okay, that, that's that's a lofty number. Uh, death by traffic accident. So car fatalities in 2013, 33,804 people. So obviously, it's a it's a smart idea that we should tell our kids, you know, not to walk down dark alleys, not mm-hmm. not to get not to get murdered. You know, be safe. Wear your, wear your seat belts. Drive slowly. Right. But I'm, I'm going to make a prediction, Gabe. <laughs> I'm going to make a prediction. Deaths by suicide are going to outnumber deaths by traffic accidents. They are. 41,149 people took their own lives. And I believe, and many people in my position, and I'm sure your position, believe that that number is, is, is just, it can be lowered so easily if we could talk about it. Sure. Conversation is key. It is. Absolutely is. But here's another way, you know, forget the numbers for just a second. Gabe, how many people have you known in your life who've been murdered? None. And how many people have you known who've killed themselves? It, it is a bit of a, of a false positive given my field, but in my actual personal life, uh, mm-hmm. one, one person, uh, personal life being like my personal friend, not people that I met in relation to mental health advocacy. Uh, right. a, a kid in um, that I went to high school with. So one. Yeah, I've uh, I've not known anybody to be murdered, but I've known uh, at least four suicides. 
So yeah, I think if you if you think about it that way, if somebody just stops and thinks, do I know anybody who's who's died by their own hand? Almost everybody is going to say yes, and that's a very very sad sad kind of thing to think about. It's very sad, of course, is because we don't even talk about it then. We sort right. of, uh, uh, not to go off too far on a tangent, but there's a lot of victim blaming. Well, it's their own fault. Oh, yeah, we could go on and on forever about that. People being angry at the person who killed themselves because it's such a selfish thing to do when, in fact, that's that's not accurate at all. It's not part of the motivation. It, understanding suicide, of course, just like understanding anything, is, is the first step to preventing it. Let's go back to the traffic accidents. You know, traffic accidents, 33,804 back in 2013. Now, interestingly enough, when cars first came out, they were dangerous. They were very dangerous. When they started getting faster and faster and faster, there was no such thing as safety features on a car. Uh, right. they, they were basically just really, really fast carriages without horses. And then people figured out, hey, they're dangerous. And people started talking about it. And that's when we started seeing you know, safety features, seat belts, airbags. And those rates have steadily declined to where driving a car is, you know, frankly, pretty safe. But imagine if when we figured out that cars were unsafe, we decided that we weren't going to do anything about it. We weren't going to talk about it. We weren't going to prevent it. And in fact, if you died in a car accident, it was your own fault because you were bad and not strong enough to drive the car properly. Well, where would we be? Interestingly, that's exactly what happened. Because when when the stats started coming in and people said, oh, crap, you know, these things are dangerous, the big three actually refused to start putting safety features in their car. They put it off as long as possible until there was a public outcry about it. And when there was a public outcry, what did we get? We got safety belts. We got, in some cases, breakaway windshields. Well, all, all the really good ones came a lot later. <laughs> but, but yeah. The point is, is there was a champion. There was a champion for this cause. Uh, I believe it was Ralph Nader. He started looking into cars, unsafe at any speed. I believe that was the Corvair. Beautiful car, right. pretty. Blew up when you rear-ended it. And no, because that was of... the Pinto. That was the Pinto. <laughs> Thank God you're older than me and you can correct my car knowledge. Mental so. health advocate, not a car guy. <laughs> the, the point is not to get too far off track, is that acknowledging there is a problem is the first step to resolving it. And over the years, cars have gotten safer and safer and deaths have gone down. And we look back, history shows us that the, the people that wanted to prevent the safety measures were just allowing people to die unnecessarily. And that's what I want to tie back to, you know, these myths about suicide, not talking about it, putting the misinformation out, uh, blaming the victim, not understanding what we're looking at is the reason that we have more more people dying by suicide than dying in car accidents. And that's really, it, it's a shame because the prevention appears so simple. Yeah. So yeah. let's talk about some other things. Uh, obviously tying it back to Christmas. I believe that another reason that the suicide rate goes down during the holidays is because volunteerism goes up. Uh, money goes up. Uh, homeless shelters are open more. Uh, services go up. People are more generous. Now, we've already talked about the holiday spirit, but we also have, uh, you know, social services in this country. Some of them are, are relatively underfunded. Uh, mental health for adults is, is one of the ones that's that's fairly underfunded. But nobody likes the idea of somebody being alone, homeless, and unhelped during Christmas, during the holiday season, during Thanksgiving. Sure. Sure. So, these services have more resources, volunteers, and time so they can help more people and keep them safe for those couple of months. Excellent point. Yeah. So what do we need to do? And of course, this is the billion dollar question. And if you can answer it, you've just solved this problem for all of the world. What can we do to encourage people that, hey, there's, there's 11 other months? That is a great question. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to motivate people to do that. One of the things that's interesting, so I, I've worked in social services for a long time. I used to work in a homeless shelter. And we would have a waiting list for people that wanted to volunteer on Christmas and Thanksgiving. A huge waiting list. And if I offered them any other day, literally any other day that wasn't Christmas or Thanksgiving, they didn't want it. They were busy. 363 other days, but they only wanted to volunteer on those two days. So on, on one hand, you know, I want to say, wow, you only want to do it on those two days so that you can brag about it. See, that would be a, a that'd be a, a good way for yeah. me to throw it back on them. Right. But there is something to be gleaned from this that doesn't make them look so bad. Maybe the social services 
aren't thanking people enough the rest of the year. Maybe social services have gotten complacent. You know, we need volunteers so badly. Is it fair to say that, hey, maybe we're not doing a good job recruiting and thanking people without the, the, the holiday helping us? What can people working in social services do to attract people the rest of the year? I don't know, free toasters with, with... <laughs> I you, listen, I, I, I work in I work in, you know, marketing and fundraising during my quote unquote day job. And the one thing that I do because my grandmother taught me to do it when I was little is write handwritten thank you notes. So listen, for mm. the mental health advocates that are that are writing in this, nothing goes further than a thank you. And the fact of the matter is is if you volunteer on Christmas and Thanksgiving, you do get uh, you get that warm and fuzzy feeling in spades for volunteering on those two days. And we do have to recapture some of that magic when people volunteer uh, on, on June 9th <laughs> uh, in the evening when nobody's around. Uh, we we right. want to make sure that we're doing that. We, we have to put some of it back on us. But of course, to the general public, you know, please, please remember that we need groups to volunteer all year round. The need is bigger than the resources that we have right now. And, and we really need to tack it on both ends. And I, I will tell you, thank you. Anybody that's thinking about doing it, thank you. Thank you so much from Gabe. You really will save lives. Excellent. I think another thing that's important is that people do need to do what we've been saying, dispel these myths about suicide, learn about it, recognize what could be going on with your loved ones uh, if they seem out of sorts at all. And of course... Always keep a particular phone number on hand. That number we will get to at the end of the show. I'm going to ask you one quick question before we do that. Utilizing sure. your your suicide counsel train or your suicide counselor training. Uh, this is very important. A lot of people talk to me and they say, "Look, I've told people that I'm suicidal. I flat out said I am suicidal. Please help me." And no one believes them, and in some cases become very mocking. You know, why are you being so dramatic? Don't be a drama queen. It, mm. it, it's a cry for help. We're not going to listen to you. What do you say to those people so that they can get help? Well, I say to them, call this number, for one thing. Secondly, uh, a lot of people, unfortunately, are like that. They, they're, they're not willing to entertain the idea that somebody might be suicidal, for reals. They're always thinking, oh, you're, like you say, drama queen, or you're just out for attention, or yada, yada, yada. And I'm not saying that there aren't some people out there in the world who have possibly been that way, who are the attention seekers and have used it that way. But but no, I think that's a very distinctly small number of people. And anytime somebody mentions suicidality, you take them seriously. I don't care what you think of them. If you think they're just joking, don't. Take them seriously. So it, if, you are, if you're not able to get people to believe you, then you're talking to the wrong people. Because there are people out there who will believe you. One quick point, of course, taking it very seriously is one of the ways that will stop people that are just using it to manipulate you from doing it. Because obviously, if you say, I'm suicidal, and that person, you know, calls 911 or calls emergency resources or take you to a doctor yeah. and doesn't, you yeah. know, buy you the new car or concert tickets that you wanted, that plan's going to backfire and they'll stop doing it. And then if they really, truly needed help and you get them that help, you've saved their lives. There, there's... There, there's no down here. Uh, then we're going to go ahead and, and finish up. What I want you to explain is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, what it is, what the number is, why it's important, and what a first-time caller can expect. Sure. So the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is a 24-7 hotline with people who do the sort of thing that I did. They talk to you. They will get you help in your area. That number, before I even forget, is 1-800-273-TALK, T-A-L-K, and keep that handy. What can you expect when you call? Well, you're going to find someone on the other end of the phone who will listen to you, who will take you seriously. They will ask you a number of questions about how you're currently feeling, if you are feeling actively suicidal. Uh, they'll ask you if you have the means to do so. There's an actual, there's a rating scale that we use when we're trying to assess just how someone is. Because here's the truth, um, and this was something that, that, that surprised me when I was uh, on the phones. Most people who call the hotlines actually aren't actively suicidal. They are in some sort of a crisis, 
that they're having a very, very difficult time with. And most of them just want someone to hear them, to actually listen to them. And oftentimes that's enough to get them through. So do you have to be actively suicidal to call these, this number? Absolutely not. It's there to help you in crisis. Then that's great information. Obviously, that number is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline for America. PsychCentral.com has the list of numbers all over the world. Please use the internet to visit them. Thank you so much, everybody, and we will see you next time. PsychCentral.com is the internet's oldest and largest independent mental health website. Psych Central is overseen by Dr. John Grohall a mental health expert and one of the pioneering leaders in online mental health. Our host, Gabe Howard, is a professional speaker, award-winning writer, and mental health advocate. You can find more information on Gabe and his work at GabeHoward.com. Vincent M. Wales is an award-winning speculative fiction novelist and suicide prevention crisis counselor. You can find more information on Vincent at vincentmwales.com. If you have feedback about the show, please email talkback at psychcentral.com.